<laughs> here's the whole thing. This is what I was excited to talk to you about to get you on the podcast. You started in radio like me. You started, yeah. by the way, mid-market radio. Yeah. What market did you start in? I started my first ever radio internship was Tallahassee, Florida. Okay. Then I moved up to Birmingham. Now you're from... Which is market 70 it's market, 50, it's market 59 <laughs> 49 now but that's I before they did the redistricting you know radio, radio is radio guys no market sizes yeah tallahassee is 91 and then i moved such up. a dick measuring thing because tucson's 63 it's like playoff seating yeah you're like i know exactly what tucson is <laughs> i could have told you like back in the day the top five where i'd be like new york la houston phoenix phoenix chicago no phoenix is 17 because i looked dropped it up. Phoenix drop. Well, when I'm I was thinking TV. Up, I'm thinking TV. Phoenix. I think Phoenix is top ten. So TV. when you, so were, you were living in Florida. Yeah, I was in college. You were in college. I was, so I was same, in college. So same. Yeah, I created the internship at that radio station. And it's just because you were when you were at college, you weren't doing stand up yet. A little bit. You had tried it. I tried it. I'd done like open. I would go over to Florida State. I went to Florida A and M, but yeah. I would go over to Florida State because I didn't want to get booed on campus and they have to see motherfuckers. Yeah. So I would go over to Florida State, pretend to be a student. I looked out, um, these two people that ran student activities for Florida State, they were from Birmingham. Okay, and that's where you grew up. Correct. And so fucking Meg and Adam, they go, hey, anytime you wanna fucking come back, and just do the student show, just for, and Florida State had comedy every fucking week, bro. It's fucking mm-hmm. Bobby Lee and Earthquake. It's like Lavelle Crawford, like they had beasts. They had real comedy. In 98, like Florida State, what I'm telling you, man, Division One tuition goes to some wild shit, bro. Yeah. It's fucking, this guy, is a, he's not nationally known, but it's by his choice. But there's this college beast. I don't even know if he's still touring. They have this motherfucker, Buzz Sutherland. Buzz Sutherland is just like some fucking- That sounds player. like, a, first off, it sounds like a 50s NFL player, <laughs> but that would be a road comic name where he's like, Buzz Sutherland was one Bro, of the best college It's comics. like when street ball or something. Like, yeah, skipped to my Jimmy room. Mickey, you know. <laughs> you didn't even know half man, half amazing. I'm telling that was a guy, man, Johnny Too Funny. That mm-hmm. motherfucker dunk on you from the three point line. You know what's line. funny though, is people don't realize in comedy that exists with every single comic. Every comic knows a guy that chose a real job instead of being the funniest. We all have a friend that None we of us know. are the funny. No professional comedian is the funniest person no. in his circle. No, we all know the guy that's the funniest that yep. doesn't need it. He doesn't need the, I get, please He had tell parents me. and love growing or, up. Or even just got <laughs> pussy young, something that like changed his brain chemistry. Yeah. Or like being the funniest at the barbershop is enough for him. Yeah, so, it's, it's scratch that itch. Yeah, that's all And we have a rash of insecurity over our whole body. So I must travel to, I must meet new strangers. I need, scratch it, scratch the Local itch. strangers are not enough. <laughs> scratch my itch. Cause I started, when I was, I started radio first because I didn't believe I could do stand up. I was like, let me get into radio cause I solid. wanted a job that was fun, that I didn't hate. And I was like, oh, well radio, I love radio. Bro, I kept a foot in radio for 12 years. That's while doing stand up. I had Letterman credits. Really? I had everything. And I was still in some capacity. If I wasn't co hosting, at minimum, I was creating content for the Birmingham station. So you were. On the off chance that all my LA, my LA move blows up in my face. Yeah. I know I can always go back to Birmingham. That, and you do know what? Mornings. That makes me feel better knowing someone as funny as you had that, like, well, I got to keep. Because I kept being like, well, I'll. If stand-up ever works out, I, I can always go back to radio. You're always worried, like, it's hard I need something to if this falls apart. Especially if you're good at it and there's not a lot of slots in radio. And as the years radio went Radio was a on, very hard profession to work in when things were good. And that's 98 when I started. Early 2000s is when I started. I started in 03. So you started at the end of the the, the change in the, I don't want to say the end, but the cha- with the rise of streaming and Napster and satellite radio. Yes, created two convergences. And, it was like fucking a two front war. And I'll tell you something that no one ever talks about that destroyed radio, CDRs, burnable CDs. Oh yeah, I make my own mixtape. Everyone did. Radio yeah. stations, that probably lost so much momentum for radio stations that they have no idea, was the ability to create your own mixtapes. You could or just- buy re- them from a local DJ. I would just buy the hottest 30 uh, songs. This is what I wanna mix. know. 
you DJ the much. White Stone, and there was um, there was a fucking mixtape called the Star Report. It was at the peak of like black black radio would just take whatever national news, yeah. and name a mixtape after I this love shit. That. And I like the fucking Ken Star, Bill Clinton, that's so Tim great. Was happening, and it that, was a mixtape called The Star Report. Oh my God! There's got to be an impeachment one from '98. I guarantee you. Or the cigars, the blue <laughs> dress tape. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Start thinking about like yeah. I hope they do that now with the Epstein list. We were like, oh, this is the Epstein <laughs> list. These are all verses about tropical islands. Somebody tweeted me, asked me if I was on the Epstein list, and I'm like, you really have the wrong skew of my celebrity. Yeah. Also. When the Epstein Island was popping, I was a fucking barely a teenager, man. If anything, I would have when, been when, an employee, not a fucking guest of the island. If they do a last dance for Epstein Island, when they do when it was at its best, when it was at its peak. More of a, what are to we catch t- a predator, but go ahead. Yeah, Chris Hansen just is. When was Epstein Island at its peak? Late I don't know. 90s? That's a good question. Because then you start thinking about like which one of these Maxim models or FHM one. Like, can yeah. Vita Guerrero speak on like going down there doing rich guy shit? Because everyone know. thinks it's going to be modern celebrities, but it's not. I don't think it's going to be enough people where it's going to be a smoking gun to affect anybody's career whatsoever. But this is the type of shit like before. Also, the internet killed radio to a degree because radio was where news was broken. Yeah. So. To get the latest gossip, you had to come to us in the morning yeah. to figure out what was what. The, what was your what was your celebrity gossip called? Four one one. Which one was it? Named? Um, morning shows always had a name for like my co-host, the uh, page New six. York at the time, who's now here at WBLS in New York City. Um, <laughs> Radio uh, guys can yeah. throw out call <laughs> the BBL, listen to the jail, like, okay. like, like, a, like gang fashions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's a rolling 66 now. Yeah, I was at WVHT <laughs> High 105.7, North Florida, <laughs> yeah. South Georgia's number one. Then I moved over to WALR and <laughs> Kiss at, 104. Yeah, Atlanta. I was at 92.1 and 101.3 KMA. <laughs> then I moved to 92.3 WXRK, which was also known as K Rock. Um, it really is like a speak radio. Young kids aren't going to have any idea of the power that it had. No, but ninety eight, you're in you're in Birmingham. Well, I was in I, at the time. I was in Tallahassee. I yeah. got to Birmingham in oh one when I graduated. Um, our co host in New York. Our news was called the What Had Happened Was. Great. Because like with black people, like right. what happened? Well, what had happened was yeah. blah 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 happened. Did you ever, did it, so we did you ever hear that old Russman Eve joke no, where no. he says the what had happened? He said that <laughs> a girl says that to him at his bodega, and she <laughs> goes, "He goes, can I get a um, pepperoni pizza bagel?" And she goes, "What had happened?" He goes, "Well, what had happened was I woke up hungry." And I that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an old joke that I always think yeah. about whenever I hear what had happened was. But, but so I did radio. So you graduate oh one. I graduate oh one. I move back home. I get an internship off of a lie to the comedy club because at the time, so Ricky Smiley, who is a syndicated legend now and yeah. stand up comic, and you know he he's walked the walk, but chose radio as the more if we're talking a sixty forty ratio. Sure. Of income, yeah, yeah, he's a radio guy. He'd lean more. He'd go do a live remote before he'd go do a gig. Correct, and he still does a live tour. But at the time, that was the rise of Ricky in the South. So, Ricky is and Ricky Smiley is and is still comedy god in Birmingham, Alabama. Okay, he was the first one yeah. from that market to really break through nationally. So when he, he left, you shut down at the Stardom. No bullshit. <laughs> Like you fucking Ricky could make a call and I love that. and I go, love that old school hey comedy. Man, hey man, uh, we got to pull you off the show tonight. <laughs> I love that old school we heard small you, town one guy running shit. We heard you did some of Johnny Two Funny's material yeah, from I last week. So you and Ricky Ha Ha were stealing off yeah. Johnny. Yeah, but you know back in those days, especially black comics, motherfuckers would check you for stealing jokes. They would pull up to your fucking show and fight you. Like, I like all that. of this back and forth over the internet and that's yeah. my joke and then let's compare clips no i'm gonna just show up and i'm gonna beat the shit out of you and then i'm gonna tell everybody that i beat the shit out of you Which so is- now you're persona non grata 
at half of the rooms where you can work. But it's funny to know that someone got their ass whooped for being like, yeah, you ever, uh, a, pus- a pussy gets wet like this? <laughs> it's like doing that bit. Yeah, That's yeah. the joke that got you beat up. Like, yeah. You ever, uh, what got your ass kicked? Well, I, I was doing this joke mm-hmm. about, you ever fuck a girl and her eyes roll back in her head and it turns out that There's was- There's two comedians, I'm not gonna name their names, I'll tell you off air. Yes, which I will get. They got into a, we decided to stay with their argument instead of going to commercials or playing music. And this is back before we kept logs and So for those of you who don't know, in radio, working in radio, commercial logs are the most important thing. Once they're introduced, it's the law. It's how the it's how the station makes money. It's how everything like you they will say cussing, cursing, whatever you want to call it, is secondary on air. Like if you cuss on air, miss your spots. It's not as bad as if you miss spots. If you miss the log, if you miss the they commercials, they add timeouts to NFL games just to play more spots. <laughs> yeah. so That's radio, how important. Radio is like you do not fuck up a log. So if you guys chose just to keep going, these two motherfuckers got into an argument, and one guy, the guy that was in studio, was a guest. And he's performing at the Stardome in yeah. Birmingham. Yeah, and he gets to talking shit about a local guy. Okay, on his so. You're you're talking shit about a local on his station where he's he can listen. You're a guest in my city and you're talking shit about me on yeah. my radio station. Yeah. Oh motherfucker, I'm gonna call the station. Oh. And they got into a 20 minute argument about who was the first to pull their pants up really really high <laughs> on stage. <laughs> that was the art. That was the bit. <laughs> it's always it's never gonna be something crazy original or it's it's always something like hacky and like. Yeah, you were the, who you, was the first one to fuck the stool? You Me put or you? the goofy teeth in your mouth, <laughs> and then you know, I like the, the redneck hillbilly teeth yeah. you can put in your mouth. Yeah, it was that. Like one of them does I a bit it. where they put the hillbilly teeth Dude. in and hitch their pants up. It's a hilarious bit, but it's physical comedy. Let's not argue the origins of. And for twenty minutes, these two motherfuckers went at it like rabbit dogs. Then, Judge Ricky Smiley. No, Ricky wasn't uh, involved. I'm trying I to know if they brought in the honorable but, Ricky Smiley. To but call. it was a matter of principle. And a couple of months later, they happened to be performing in the same city and they had a fight. I can't. I, those, those, that's the most details I can give you on here without people being able to go and back engineer okay, who, now, who they are. My question but is what I'm saying is like, if you stole from me, we fight. We're go- eventually we are going to fight. Uh, OK. You talking shit about me in my hometown. By the time I get to the radio station, you're going to be gone. That's cool. But sooner or later. And the motherfucker found him and he fucking fought. I wish we kept that law. That's <laughs> fucking. But that's the. We, we used to fucking have standards. In this well, business, yeah, well, that, that's all gone now because now someone with like a lot of followers does your joke. And all of a sudden you're like, well, now I, I have no. I can't fight that. That boy talked there. that shit. They talked that shit, and then one of them got knocked out at their merch table in front of their fans oh, three months later. Which, how do you not put a shirt over the knocked out body, <laughs> take a picture, and sell that as the poster? <laughs> if I'm snoozing, if I get put to sleep in front of my merch, take the picture, because we're selling more merch with that picture than we are with that. <laughs> like the Ghetto Boys when Bushwick got shot yeah, in the eye. Yeah, when they in the hospital with him on the yeah, cell phone. Yeah, and they just put yeah, him on his gurney. Yeah, yeah. He said, take the picture, album cover. Yeah, dude, that's what it is. Is. If you get because comedy and and you know we always talk about this comedy is always losing. That's why like this yeah. this boom of cool comedy doesn't work because you're supposed to be a loser. You're supposed to be the guy. It's funnier if you get knocked yeah. out than if you knock a guy out and then tell the story. It's like how Chris Rock has a better story to tell than Will Smith. Yeah, if he would have been the Will Smith, that wouldn't have been funny. Yeah, if Chris had fought back and like won, that's still not a funny. No, story, it's but. it's better if you're the victim. If you're the if you're the punching. <laughs> if you're the punchline, that's funnier. Yeah, but man, we did. I did radio. Ricky leaves town to go start a new show, so now I'm the guy replacing Ricky, and so they do a huge like a local. You're replacing a local legend, a literal and legend. This is after you interned. I've interned in Tallahassee. This is the only reason that got me the conversation in Birmingham was because I had a degree in broadcast and I was actively doing stand up. It's the only reason Birmingham even considered me. Mind you, my father is a fucking radio legend from literally from the South African Soweto riots. My father up until his death in 95 was a Birmingham news radio legend. So really? that helped Boy, get, senior? Correct. That helped get me 
a foot in the door. My father covered, embedded with the Vietnam soldiers, Soweto riots. He was in Zimbabwe, Rhodesian Civil War shit. It's your every, war zones. Every conflict you can name from like the fucking 40s till, Korean till Rodney King. My pops was there with a tape recorder. So he's a respected name. And I have a brother also named Roy who was... At that time, he was the evening anchor on NBC 13 in Birmingham. So I have pedigree journalistically. I mean, you're, journalistically, your family runs the news in Birmingham. Yeah, but motherfucker, is you as funny as Ricky Smiley? <laughs> Dude, that's it's so all, funny to That's me. all Birmingham. You come from like the Cronk Heights of Birmingham, <laughs> and then they're like, but Ricky Smiley, Can a name you do like that. prank calls, yeah. though. Dude, it's funny to think that your dad's out here busting like really major stories and your brother's like, this just in, <laughs> the Challenger has exploded and you're going like, did you put your ass on the phone? Like, yeah. You're doing like radio calls. I'm calling. Like, the door is not open. And I'm calling like, gas stations to book <laughs> celebrity barbecues. Oh, I love it. <laughs> like just silly shit. Did you? Was there ever an insecurity about that? Was there ever like like living in the shadow? Yeah, like because your your nah. family's like your dad's like this journalistic. Yeah, but I grew up at that time in my twenties. I was twenty one. I had a chip on my shoulder sure. about my pops, so I didn't care about the shadow. My goal was to eradicate his reputation. So you were like, watch me. Watch yeah, me it was right. Very, yeah, it was. It was on some. Good father, bad husband. So, okay. you know, my pops, our relationship was very two sided. Sure. Just, you know, it just it wasn't as level as you would like for a relationship to be. But there was still a lot of respect professionally. Yeah. But that but that drives you to be like. But that drove me to be. I'm, a I'm going to be I'm going to make them forget your name. Not realizing that the more I rise, it only helps him yeah. because you cannot escape who you are. You cannot also escape your father's junior. Life. So it's like they're following the name all the way to the end to realize it's a different person. It took me almost 20 years to realize that his legacy is his legacy and I'm just building my own and yeah. they stand together. It's two buildings. It's not one building growing I, higher and shadowing the other. Like inevitably, if my legend grows, so does his what, because I stand on his shoulders. At what point did you have that breakthrough? Because I'm coming from a completely opposite perspective where absentee father, gone, dead. I have the thing of like, well, I'm going to make my name. When, I'm, when I was young, 21, getting into comedy, yeah. it's like, well, I'm going to make this a name because... So I just know that in my 30s was when I was like, oh, this has nothing to do with him at all. Was it in your 30s that you realized Yeah, that? it was when I had my son. Really? It was long. I had my son to 37. Yeah. What am I, 45 now? Yeah. So it was somewhere around when I had my kid where it, it just reconstitutes fatherhood. And then you look back at the relationship and you're, okay, well, there's some things I could have done better and some things he could have done better. Oh, well, you know. Yeah, you start. Yeah, but because... I have to take the best of him and also give that to my son. Sure. So it forced me to look at the good things about my dad. Yeah. And then you realize how many of those qualities are in you now. And you look up at yourself in your thirties and you go, fuck me. I'm him. Yeah. I'm the guy that rides around the city doing nothing but as many good deeds as possible in Birmingham. When I'm out in the grocery store, people speak to me. It's a friendship. Like, like Birmingham is, is different than that. It's not a city where I think I'll ever be famous. Sure. I don't perform there in 12 years because I don't think I could sell a ticket because everyone knows me. It's like, yeah. I'm your I'm your cousin, I'm your uncle. You're I'm, very, they're very familiar, but they would buy a ticket to see you in another city if they were there. And they would support me in a heartbeat. When we had, when you, the Daily Show ratings, I fucking carried Alabama. <laughs> On my back. Yeah. They go like, just like, someone keeping stats in the office of Comedy Central. Yeah. Like, dude, oh, dude, dude, there's dude, a spike dude. in oh, Alabama. Lord, Alabama's off the charts. Bro, we did an Alabama week. And we went down and covered the state of Alabama for a whole fucking week and just did stories focused on that community. And a lot of that is because of that's, like you said, everything's data now. Yeah. That's, there's a reason why you fucking went down there. So that place. I love, I still go back every, and that's part of my fault. I'm also super visible. Every time there's something charitable yeah, to not, do. That's and, not and necessarily I, a bad thing. I know, and I'm, and I'm yeah. cool with that. So, but that's exactly who my father was. He just going around doing that? He did good stuff. 
He helped a gang of people. Man, your daddy hired me the one time and the thing. I go around and do radio now. Yeah. And I'm, oh, bro, when I did the correspondence dinner. Yeah. Motherfucker, there is a table. American Urban Radio Network. My dad was one of the co-founders of the National Black Network, which in the 70s was a syndicated news channel dedicated to only delivering black news. It was yeah. the first of its kind. So the idea- If you sunburn, get the fuck out of that. Yeah. Your news yeah. will not be covered. <laughs> so, you freckly fox, get so out of here. So they did, <laughs> you freckled fox. <laughs> you freckled fox got your own news. <laughs> you freckled fox. Go get put on it. your SPF 50 and get the fuck out of our face. Bro, for like, and, and keep in mind, this was in Chicago at WVON. My father was one of the, people to give Don Cornelius some of the front money for Soul Train. Like, he was a good dude. Like, didn't take no producer credit, was which there, you fucking shit at yeah, I mean, my God. First off, <laughs> he, he didn't believe He didn't believe an idea, which I understand at the time. But it is funny. He's like, I have his friend Don, and his friend Don's like, what if there was a train? A soul train. That's if literally, that's doing, pretty much what the conversation was. If they do the Don Cornelius biopic, and he's that's like, it's like, Roy Wood Sr., I know you're not going to believe me. I wish you they would have played your dad. I wish they would have put it in the, there was a show on BET called American Soul and went two or three seasons, and, and they showed the moment where Don met my dad. They added that to the series. They didn't show the moment where my dad turned down the soul train bread, but my father met Don Cornelius. Don Cornelius used to be a cop. He pulled my dad over for a ro- for rolling through a stop sign. My pop goes, you have a nice voice, motherfucker. Come work at this radio station. Fuck this police shit. Don Cornelius says, bet. Starts doing radio. And that's, then that's beca- that began Don Cornelius' journey through media. And my father was one of the people he went to. Hey, give me a couple of dollars. I got an idea. We're going to do some Dick Clark shit. Yeah. And my dad's like, all right, here's some money, but just bring it back. You want to be a producer? No, just bring me back my money. That oh. ain't nobody gonna watch that shit. And then it becomes Soul Train. It became Soul Train. You know what's funny about that is deep voices are the only other thing besides <laughs> being hot that get you jobs. Where you go, like you know, like Pam Anderson got discovered at like a Toronto Argonauts football game on the big screen, and they were like, "I didn't know that." Oh yeah, they like showed her, and everyone was like, "Who is that girl's gorgeous?" And then she became like the Molson Ice Girl, and then like, and then off to the races, and then off to the races. But it really is that thing where you're like. <laughs> do you know why I pulled you over? And he goes, that's a great voice. And he's yeah. like, well, I'm just a cop. <laughs> and then it's like, well, you gotta get, it's the only other thing besides being sexy is having yeah. a voice that someone's like, I could listen to you read. Remember the golden yeah. voice guy? The yeah, the homeless guy. Homeless guy in Cleveland. Yeah. And, it, and it turns out he was a radio guy that just partied his dick off out of the industry. And just fell off. They just fell off. And then they, like, he got all that money and he's like, Looks like I'm back to my old habits. <laughs> when you fall Bro. off the wagon with that voice, looks like it's time to do cocaine again. Can't kill King. <laughs> I will snort that, please. <laughs> I'm looking forward to doing that railer, railer blow. <laughs> <laughs> so your so, dad basically is the re- was one of the reasons Soul Train. My dad is one of the backbones of black radio. That is. So you're and doing so, the correspondence dinner. So I'm doing the correspondence dinner, and there's these, the American Urban Radio Network the National Black Network eventually through mergers and blah, blah, blah over yeah. the decades became American Urban Radio Network, which is still standing to this day. And it's a collection of syndicated black content and of cross genres of formats of music. Yeah. And afterwards, just black person after black person after black person is just coming up to me and just going, your dad hired me, da, 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 da. I first worked for your father when da, da, da. Your father helped me with the da, da, da. Just countless motherfuckers just from across the country. So when you have a kid and you're trying to figure out, well, what's the best parts of me? And then you're comparing what's the best parts of your pops. And there's a lot of shit on the list that matches up. Yeah. You have to accept that you are him. Yeah. There is no erasing him. You literally are him. Yeah. 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 You're 50% his DNA. Yeah. So that's when I, like let go of the shit. But at the time in Birmingham when I was you know, 21 and I'm trying to get a job and I'm trying to replace Ricky Smiley, my, my point to all of that is that that's how huge Ricky Smiley was, was that I needed stand up, a degree in journalism and my family reputation yeah. just to get a chance to even be thought that maybe you could replace Ricky and sit in that chair. I mean, that is a massive, being that young and replacing a legend is, 
especially at the time when radio is as big as it is, people don't realize that is a massive this ask. Is Pete Howard Stern, Opie and Anthony. I mean, radio. Star and Buck Wild, Wendy Williams. Uh, Star and Buck Wild was Tom massive. Tom Joyner, Morning Show, Big Boy on the Big West Boy Coast. Uh, was L.A. Uh, Kevin and Bean were at K Rock L.A. Bubba Love Spawn. Bubba don't even Love. give him love. He fucking he was he was running shit at the time yeah, i mean in florida you also had uh mike calta who went by cowhead yes. and then you had up in chicago you had uh cowman uh what the other cow oh man cow man cow yeah. you had man cow and cowhead but it was like it was like um an apocalyptic world when like different places run the territories where the, it's like that was what radio it's was game of thorn. it's thiefdom it was and it was like stern was the first one to go syndicated and then all everyone followed you know and you had yeah. ona syndicated you had star and buck wild were syndicated yeah, big Tom boy joiner ran the south star and buck yeah. wild had the east coast big boy had everything west of dallas mm -hmm. russ parr had kind of that middle big 10 big 12 territory and i remember i was working in radio i was in tucson when stern left k-rock in new york and went to sirius xm and i remember them carving it up between adam carolla was the west coast yep. and david lee roth was the east coast really that's what they gave the east coast station? at first and then he failed so bad that they gave it away to people but i worked when i moved here in 07 i was doing the same thing where i was like i need radio i can't just do stand-up well, radio would help sell tickets. So my idea was this. If I could do prank calls as good as Ricky, then it'll give me the creative freedom to do everything else I want to do in yeah. radio. I wanted to do goofy songs and funny sketches and like take it back to that 1950s radio play yeah. type shit. But for urban radio. Sure. But that's a tough sell to a PD who just got fucking five years out of a guy who just every morning just could just improv yeah. the most hilarious prank calls and he would do funny calling characters. Oh fuck, Bob and Tom. Bob and Bob, Tom were Bob huge. and Tom was a little later, like old, well, late 90s, early 2000s. But they made comics in a way that similar to O&A, where if you got on Bob and Tom and you more, had- More relevant than Letterman. For yeah. me, for me. Well, for touring. For if me. you did Bob and Tom, I remember Nate Bargetzi, I was opening for him. This is like, oh, eight. He got a call to do Bob and Tom. And we were like nervous. We were like driving out to the gig. And he's like, I got, we were in a parking lot somewhere. And he's like, I got to wake up at like 7 a.m. and do Bob and Tom. And we we're like, bro, here we go. That shit changed my touring before I left the building. Really, Tom. and it's not, and I, and I say that with respect to David Letterman and Late Night as a whole. But by the time I did Letterman in '06, I'd already been on Bob and Tom for two years, so I could have a comparison of which one changed my life in a yeah. more instantaneous yeah. status. Late Night in '06 was in 1996. It was a great credit. It was great leverage within the industry. But to say that the general public's level of give a fuck about you was swayed radio for me swayed people faster it swayed club owners faster than being on letterman and at it, that time and this is just something that's interesting for two guys that have done both radio and stand-up our whole careers you see it now again with podcasts podcasts are the new radio yes you get on a podcast it can change your touring more than any tv appearance a million percent like look at rogan rogan i've watched him make a lot of my friends millionaires it's like you go on like, remember what the fuck when Marin came out? Yeah. It was like, if you got on that, it, it would change who listened to you. And Marin started that because Air America got 86 by Sirius XM. That's exactly what I talked to him about because I got fired from K-Rock a month after Marin got fired from Air America. And I was like, you it's don't remember when we talked at Eastville about getting fired from radio and he was like oh man and I was like <laughs> yeah dude I remember because radio the thing about radio and I still have friends that work in radio it's like it 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 was shrinking to the point where you're like how are you making your living doing this it got scary because they started automating everything Hey, everybody, hitting the road in 2024. Uh, a lot of fun shows coming up. February 3rd, I'm going to be at New York Comedy Club in Stamford, Connecticut. February 4th, I'm going to be at the Funny Bone in Hartford. 
Then February 17th, two shows at the Wilbur Theater in Boston. First show almost sold out, so get tickets before it does. Second show, there's there's tickets available. DanSoder.com for all those. And then Cleveland, Ohio, coming to Hilarities, one of my favorite clubs. I'm going to be there February 22nd through February 24th. So the month of February is all up at DanSoder.com. We'll see you in Connecticut, in Massachusetts, and in Ohio. DanSoder.com. Thanks for listening to the podcast or following me. Whatever. However you took this. Thank you. And I tried it for a year. with it. Bro, when I was doing Daily Show my first year, I was still doing mornings in Atlanta on a satellite box. I was in. You were doing room. ISDN? I was doing. No, because I my building wouldn't allow me to install one. So I was on a Verizon 4G <laughs> internet card. Just calling every morning? Every morning doing live breaks and in between. Now, granted, this is in the later days of radio where you only took two breaks an hour, two three minute breaks, one at the 10, one at the 40. So. If we pre-recorded a couple of breaks, I could get an hour to myself to be a father in the morning. I have a yeah. A this is when you were, right when you had your son. One year, got a one year old, and I'm in the living room doing morning radio in Atlanta, and then we are off the air. We go into a music sweep at nine. I so love I sweeps. At nine. God, I play, love the radio talk. Really, we just play me music. Up. We just play music for an hour till ten. And play spots, so I would get off the air at nine, and I would be in morning meeting by nine ten. I'd For be, the Daily Show, I'd be at the Daily Show, and then I would start my day at the Daily Show. So then, you worked full two full time jobs, and then I got off the Daily Show at six because in those days, whether you were on the show or not, you were either working on a piece or editing a piece. Is this or, when John's still the host? No, no, this is Trevor. This, this is, is Trevor. all first year Trevor. This is like early, late twenty fifteen, early twenty sixteen, and at this point, I would get off air. At like I would get I would leave Daily Show at six, come home, be a father till eight, and then I would hit the clubs because I had an hour special that I was polishing. So now I'm in the clubs till midnight. Now I lay down and I get back up at five in the morning, do my show prep for thirty minutes for Atlanta. At this point, I had to hire an intern from the show. I was paying him fifty bucks to send me just news stories. Just send me news stories. Send me twenty twenty stories. That is in now, and, and then and, I would get up at, and then I would fire up my old Verizon four G card at five forty five, and be ready for the first break at six ten. So wow. you're going on air. I mean, you're going on air at six a.m. Yeah, live, and then, live, and then you're basically working up until midnight with maybe four hours to yourself on average, four hours. But how good did it feel to quit that? It felt good, but there was still the paranoia because I still oh. didn't have the job security at Comedy Central yet. It was still, I'm still on first year rookie deal. So, so you're on a rookie contract and you're like, I got to get this. I got to fucking, so I got to quit radio because I need the mental real estate. Yeah. Well, you which to do comedy and daily show correctly. And if I do those correctly, I'll make more money. Sure. Which will cover quitting radio. Yeah. It's now that's, that, that's, that's a theory. That's all you're operating on. Well, at so. That point. As someone that, and both of us come coming up doing radio, I think there's a part of it where you start writing it off where you don't think radio is an effort because you came up doing it, wanting to do stand up. Yeah, so when you, you know. so when you do stand up though, you're like, like I remember when I would do, like I got Bonfire and I got Billions at the same time, Oof. and I remember going like, Oof. well, Bonfire's just hanging out. That's not work. This is me and Jay bullshitting for two hours. I got to work on the scene. I got to work on this twice a week, right? No, we did it four times, four shows a week, oh, two Lord. hours a day. Oh Lord. So that's what I mean when I say like, and y'all weren't pre-recording cause y'all took calls. Yeah, we took calls. We were live. Fuck. So, but I got my final thing with radio through the bonfire because I got fired from K rock in 09. And I was like, I'm done with radio. They, the way they let us all go, the way it was like, we all knew it was coming, but they didn't want to tell us it was coming. So they just started laying people off in like levels where you're like, hey, we we all know you're going to wipe us out. Just tell us you're going to wipe us out so we can start looking. And they're like, nah, you're fine. And then uh -huh. music director gets fired and then they hire someone else. Then he gets fired. They start doing format changes. That's why you got to leave, bro. When you feel that shit getting But weird. I was here. I was in New York. I was on air in New York where I wanted to do stand up. And so the only other option would have been like move to Des Moines and do afternoons at the rock station. Correct. So I was like, I was watching it slip away. So when I got fired from K Rock, I was like, fuck radio. Radio's dead anyways. Yeah. And then got this opportunity with Sirius XM where they were like, do you want to do a show? And I was like, well, yeah, Jay and I want to do a show. And they were like, 
well, let's do, I got to do my own thing in a way that felt better than anything I've ever done in radio where it was See. like, Oh, I get to go in and just be me and I get no notes. It's got to be that. And to me, terrestrial radio is still run by consultants. And I've had, and like when I left Dave's Oh, the consultants in terrestrial radio. If people knew at home how many of these guys, I was trying to think of the guy, Darren or Dylan, that used to be the consultant that would come in and fuck up KFMA. But then he would be like, I might be able to get Metallica for your big concert. But then he would like ruin all these great ideas. Yeah, radio stations pay private companies. Yes half a million dollars to come in and tell them what they're doing right and wrong yes based on what they've observed at other stations that they're also That's contracted it. they're to trendsetters evaluate. they don't know the actual station they're working with they're just yeah. coming in and here's something that worked over there yeah try it here but i understand why they do that because 80 percent of radio stations are owned by four companies now I so think. when i was in radio clear channel was the was the enemy and yeah, then when I got fired, bad. they changed to I Heart Radio. Yeah. I love radio. Motherfucker, you were ruining it. When you were Clear Channel, you were buying up every station and making it all the same. Yeah, every market plays the same. There's like a bucket of 120, 130 songs, and you can pull from that bucket and only And they that have different bucket. categories like power, gold, like they have like different. Yeah, recurring power God, news. But, oh, dude, let's get into the programming talk. Yeah. I could do programming talk all day. Yeah, but there was a song that was the shit last year that you don't mind hearing again that you're not quite tired of. Yes. That would be a power new versus new power, power new. And they would program it like boop, 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 one, two, three, four, yeah, one, two, like three. Snake schedule fantasy draft, like one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, That's four. That's why when you listen. back jam. <laughs> yeah. One, two, That's three, why four, when five. anyone listens to radio and they go, well, they play all the long songs. You go like, well, it's actually, that is, that is true. It's by design. It's so that they can, yeah. they can, Mike, do you yeah. think, and this is just a theory, do you think if someone had the balls in terrestrial radio to go like, let's just open it up. Let's just get as close to breaking the FCC as possible. And let's let people program what they want to program, play what they want to play. You'd be betting your job. You yeah. bet your job on it. Also, the other part, the other problem with radio, in my opinion, to a degree is that they rely heavily on research and these ratings monitors that people can basically in real time, they can see down to the syllable when someone changes the station. Yeah. So near the end, near the end of me in Birmingham, at least you got an email. I found out on Twitter that I was fired. From no Birmingham. way. Yeah. I've been there 12, 13 years. It's crazy. It, what's what was the tweet? What's even weirder about radio is that, I'm not even mad at the dude. Like, we're still cool. Like, we're cool now. It wasn't cool then. But you're cool but the way boxers are cool after a fight. Years later, in yeah. retrospect. Where you man, guys were both a at a run, Nissan man. opening, and you guys are both shaking hands going, you beat the shit yeah, out of me. You go, you I get it. You fired, you fired me partly because I moved to L.A., and I was doing the show on a sat line, and we both agreed that the show needed to be done locally sure. to grow into syndication. But I felt you were reneging on syndication, and Steve Byrne offered me that fucking sitcom on TBS, and I lived in L.A. seven years and didn't book shit. And the year I moved back home to do radio, fine as a host burn off of your sitcom <laughs> yeah, that's great. you're bullshitting so yeah fire up the old Verizon card motherfucker yeah, yeah. and I, I used to get up you think the fucking Atlanta shit was crazy with Daily Show when I was living in LA doing Sullivan and Son I was up at 3 a.m. <sighs> West Coast to do 5 a.m. show prep yeah for an hour Ugh. we show prep for an hour because I was the host so I had to be a little more thorough and then we would do the show four hours. Then I would get up and go to rehearsal all day for a multicam. And then have to wake up and do it again. And then do sets that night, bitch, because I'm in LA and I'm on a sitcom. So you can't lose this heat. You got to go out in the clubs. You know what? It, it, it was psychopath. And I, and I you don't realize it. how exhausted you are. Like when. But it was like, God damn, I was, oh, baby, I was doing it. And yeah, back but that's like, the part that gets you nap. through. But you see, you know, like I think a lot of people when. And we've watched friends of ours get very famous and kind of fall off with stand up. We won't name names, but we know people that have gotten really big and then their stand up falls off a cliff and you realize, well, yeah, they're doing 40 things. They're not just doing stand up. So because yep. you get all these opportunities, but people that see your stand up at that moment maybe don't realize that you're hosting a morning show in Atlanta. You're on Sullivan and Sons. You're on and you're doing stand up. So someone that just likes your stand up is like, oh, I don't know. 
I can show you episodes of Sullivan and Sons where I'm about to fall asleep. I would love to break that down. Ground. I want to tell you right now, I will do a sleepy tape episode of this podcast and we will come in and watch all Bro, the episodes where you are about to fall asleep. Because fucking season one, the script was like 60 pages. I probably had three pages of lines. Yeah. So the extent of me in every episode of Sullivan and Son, it's just in the background drinking fucking ginger ale with TV foam on top. Yep. So it looks like beer. So I'm just drinking fucking ginger ale oh, for I, five hours you're during talking, a taping, and I'm just fucking sugar pre-diabetic <laughs> nodding off. <laughs> yeah, you just fall asleep. Like, get him another soda. And you go, my blood, my feet are tingling. Please don't do that. There was a lot of billions where I would have like a 12-hour day with a line, and then you're just I'm just in the background fake typing on a computer, and there's moments where it's like. Dude, I, 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 there's moments where I'm just like staring. I, it's hard. You can bro. tell a couple episodes where I'm just like looking at the computer, <laughs> and they're like, oh, I, I couldn't even fake type. I was tired. Yeah, it, it's, it was, it was all worth it. But just if I got back into radio, I do miss it. I do miss the connection with people. That's the thing that I miss most, and that's the thing that I love the most about the Daily Show. But also, became more difficult to do. Sure near the end of my run was well you're also getting more exciting stuff too like because the, the job of correspondent you're still going out and talking to people but once we got into the guest host rhythm of the show yeah it was hard to gauge how what story to send chorus like clepper had his beat but as a correspondent you weren't going out the doors frequently sure because also you were needed at the barn to do sketches and do other interactive shit. And we were down a man because Jabuki had left. You know, Ronnie is doing Marvel movies and crazy rich Asian sequel. So we're operating on like an eight man roster. We're supposed to be, you know, full strength, supposed to be running 13. So I wasn't going out as much. So there's part of that human connection that like, yeah, I would love to get that back. But to get back in radio, it would be like, it's like, it's like Casino. When they asked De Niro to run the Tangier, yeah, yeah. Like, all right, if I do it, it's got to be my way. No interference. Yeah. My rules. My rules, yeah. That's what no you are. No one else can tell me You're, what to do. It's my fucking, it's my club. Do you see a De Niro casino moment coming up? Like maybe when you're older and the touring for stand-up has calmed down and you've done stuff. I think, would you move back to Birmingham and be the guy? I don't know if I would move back to Birmingham for radio specifically. I do know eventually I will end up back in Birmingham. You, th- That's where you're going to end I up. I love the city too much and I care too much. But right now we're trying to get, um, you know, I hosted the all MLB awards show. And part yeah, of David our, Purdue. I, I saw Dave in, uh, in Atlanta. Yeah. And so part of my reasoning for doing that show was to start getting in the mix and building a relationship with major league baseball, because there's a lot of opportunities where baseball and, you know, with CC Sabathia and the work that he's doing, we're trying to keep black kids, you know, sure. in the sport. And they're renovating Rickwood Field for the throwback game that they're doing next year. And that Rickwood's in Birmingham. That's the field where I grew up playing. Yeah. So there's a lot of good that could be done. And I think ultimately what my role is to the city of Birmingham, I am the middleman liaison between the city and the money faucets across the country. That's great, though. So that's what I'm trying. That's to like do. an importance on the level of your of what your dad did. Let me leverage. You're my an ambassador, little bit of celebrity. Yeah. Hey, have you thought about Alabama? For yeah, this you went out and spoke to the coastal elites, and you can bring their pretty much. You can bring their Epstein Island money into Birmingham. <laughs> Jesus, to don't it's Major League Baseball. I'm sorry. If you're, if you're on Epstein Island. <laughs> Major League Baseball. You. you owe our family an apology because <laughs> Katie list, had a great season. What if Epstein's list just says? football yeah you go oh no oh no no. oh brady manning all of them yeah so like radio bro like getting that job in 01 like i lied (laughs) i lied to get the because they audition a gang of people after ricky leaves they hire nobody yeah and then i come to town like two three months after the con they're just like we're just not gonna have a comedian for a while and we'll just have more comedian guests from the comedy club sure and i go in i go hey man um you know i play the local club here um 
you know, could I could I come in and audition? Here's my air check, which is like your audio resume. I have air check tapes in this uh, at the top of that closet. I have about I'm not joking. When I tell you 20 CDs that are all air just check you tapes. talking on the radio. Just, just listen me doing, to me talk. Just me doing speed breaks at KFMA. So K Rock. He goes, thanks, man. We're really not looking for anybody right now. I go, well, can I just create content? Can I do news updates for you? Because yeah. that's what I was doing in Tallahassee. I was sure. just hard news. Like my now pops. you're at the point of the interview where you're just going, let me in the building. Yeah, this isn't even an interview. Yeah. This is in the parking lot. Like I'm stalked this motherfucker <laughs> yeah. at the at the staff entrance. Yeah. He's got his keys in his hand. He's yeah. like, what are you doing to me? 530 in the morning. Really? Samuel Mack. I fucking ambushed this motherfucker because that's what Ricky Smiley did. That's how Ricky Smiley got the job. Was he just bothered a guy in the parking lot? Ricky Smiley showed up to that fucking radio station every fucking morning and cracked on them as they walked in the door. That's that's a that's a great way to show Roasted your skills. Them. Unless it goes too well, unless you hit a topic that he doesn't want to talk about, Ricky, then he's like, I will never hire you, motherfucker. The stories it was I told do to me, waddle like a duck. Back in those days, the radio station when Ricky started, the radio station was on ground level, like and you could just see in off the street. Yeah, yeah, that's how ours was. And he would just roast them through the glass that's great in the morning just and they're yeah. like you got to come inside sorry you gotta come. so i go i go to i go to sam mac uh buckwild was his name not the same buckwild yeah and i go man just let me fucking just let me sit in yeah we're not, we're not done. I go, okay cool so then what i remembered was that 95 7 jams always hosted the black comedian that friday at the stardom and stardom every other week it was dl hughley or adele get monique and all those yeah, yeah and so some more correct so the radio station would come and give out shirts on stage before introducing some more's opener sure i know that i know you're gonna fucking be i know where you're gonna be friday yeah i don't have to keep coming here you will just see my comedy and then you will yeah, love it's me. The, the interview right there now i have to convince the comedy club to let me open oh my for god it's like a heist and DL brings his own fucking people. Yeah. So he doesn't need a fucking The second you can bring your own people, you bring your own people. So I go to the comedy club. I go to Bruce Ayers. And I go, hey, man, I just got hired at 95.7 as the intern. That's a big shot downfield. What, what are you going to do? Find out I lied and then just not book me and I'm still in the same fucking boat. So fuck it. Yeah. Throw, throw the bomb. Yeah, yeah. Hey, man, I just got hired at 95.7 and I know they host when DL comes, but I talked to Buck Wild. Buck said I could do five minutes and then bring up DL's opener. And then Bruce goes, all right, cool, congratulations. See you Friday. Did you have that feeling leaving that day where you're like, it worked? What the, no, it hadn't worked yet, bitch. I had to <laughs> get to Friday. Yeah, you still gotta do the set. So I go back to the radio station. I wait till 10 o'clock, I wait for Buck and him to get off the air. Buck come back out in the parking lot. I go, hey man, just so you know, I'm not gonna bother you anymore, but I'm opening for Dio Hughley on Friday. So when y'all come and do the shirts and everything, you'll be bringing me on stage. Just do me a favor. When you come off stage, just watch me. And if I'm not funny, you don't have to, we don't have to talk ever again. Yeah. He said, deal. Get to the radio, get to the comedy club that night. Now all I have to do is keep Buck Wild and Bruce Ayers apart. <laughs> this is like a sitcom. It's like Mrs. Doubtfire where he keeps the, running the change. Neither of these motherfuckers know that I've lied to yeah, the other motherfuckers. You can't let them find out. Fucking Bruce comes backstage. Okay, so what are we doing? What's the what's the order? And then I just spring up. Yeah, Buck's gonna go out and give out the shirts. He'll bring me up. I'll do five. Beautiful. And uh, DL, you cool? I think he had Malik ass with him at the yeah. time. DL, and I'll bring up Malik. I'll bring you up. That's cool. DL, that's cool. That work. I'm only, I'm gonna do a tight three. I'm not even gonna do five. <laughs> yeah. I'm with the radio station. You really did a catch me if you can kind of version of getting a job where you're like, I know how to play it perfectly. That if it goes right, you get away with it. Bro, I don't know how it fucking just one of those nights where every joke hits, every just, syllable hits, every. Did you know on stage you're like, this is I got it. Like, if he doesn't hire me, it's not because I wasn't funny. Yeah, I went out and I fucking did the job in front of Jam's listeners. This is Dio Hughley. This yeah. is the blackest, the fucking. And I got a home field advantage because I know everybody. We didn't have time for this in this pod, but because my mom bounced me around to so many schools growing up in Birmingham, 
I knew the whole city. Yeah. Because I've fucking, I've been to the east side. I've been to school yeah. on the south side. I started on the west side. I went to the boys club with this guy. Played salt. Like, yeah, played yeah, yeah. fucking. You really league. are like the comedic mayor of Birmingham. So everyone at least knows me. You don't not already know me. And your fucking parents know my daddy. Yeah. So it's fucking home field advantage. I mean, crazy home field advantage. Like a homecoming game. Fucking, I fucking crush. That's bro. great. I crush that night. And I come off stage and Buck Wild is standing there and he says, see you Monday morning, bring Krispy Kreme. No way. And that started my whole And they invented career. an internship. Or they in got Tallahassee, you a job. In Tallahassee, I created an internship that got me the leverage to get me the job in Birmingham. And so you get the and job so and then you just start Monday. I start Monday and that was it. And that's, that's how I got my job in radio. And you have to start doing print. And immediately... I started getting my lumps because I'm not as funny as Ricky. By yeah, the way. I mean, it's a it's, rhythm you have to learn. But I was, I could that's what no my one, ass off though. No one ever talks about in those moments of like, I fought for it and I got it. What they, it's like a romance movie. They always stop the romance movie right as they get together. They don't show a year in when they hate each other for certain shit. And they're like, you fucking, you ate my, you ate my cereal. It's like, well, you dumb bitch. You shouldn't put it in there. They always just show like, I love you. I love you. And then it just ends like that <laughs> with job stories like that. They never tell you, oh, it sucked. And I, I bombed. They never, they never tell you that part of it. And I feel like they also never tell you the fact that soldier through sucking and if you're not good at one thing, figure out something else that you're good at within that job. And or learn how to get, you can also learn how to get, to you. you can learn how to get good at it because I, and we got to wrap up, but I was, I did the same thing with KFMA in Tucson where I just, I went to their website and I found, I didn't wake up at 5.30 in the morning and go to the parking lot. Like that's a dedication that's blowing my mind that you can be up that early. I'm 20, I'm 21, what else I got to do? I know, exactly, but still 21, waking up that early you and you're like- If you radio and you rip, you will eat forever because you have an audience. And so my idea was get on as a co-host, be funny here, and then Memphis will put me on. Mike Evans will put me on. I'm thinking of all the other local shows. If I do well here, then I know that I know people in Atlanta yeah. will put me on the radio and I'll do well. Frank Ski will fuck with me because I'm funny it's over here. It's just a here. step. You keep going. And you rip in Atlanta, whatever bit I'm doing. And so the, the only thing I figured out was I could, take my, I could take my prank phone calls. At the time, this is pre-YouTube, pre-Napster, Bear Share. I will put my pranks on my website for people to download after the show. Hey, if you like the prank from today, go to my website. And that's how I started building my email list. And all that's of that genius. Shit. I never had foresight like that. That yeah. is incredibly smart to be like, here you but, go. But that was just ingenuity out of anger in a weird way, because the IT guy at the station at the time, this motherfucker. Engineers always beef with the on air, by the way. If you're wondering about radio yeah, engineers, there is a legitimate division between on-air talent and engineers because engineers build everything they make sure everything runs and then they just look at on-air talent as the divas that fuck everything yeah. up greg garcia yeah. i hope you're doing all right but we butted heads a lot and you got he used to get real mad i got stoned on commercial breaks when i worked at kfma <laughs> he'd be like it's unprofessional you're with a bunch of fucking equipment and i was like shut, shut up shut the fuck up I, shut up i'm gonna play corn when we I'm get back my ass on these prank phone calls and we're only playing them once and then we replay the best ones by request on friday but nothing else is being done with them. so they're just being tossed aside so i go to the it guy i go hey man and this is before the idea of web traffic and creating content and a station needing to figure out how to draw people to the web i mean it's, that's what killed radio it's exactly go, what killed radio i go to the it guy i go hey man you know it'd be cool is if we just let the pranks live on the website and then people could just go to 957jams.com and just listen to any prank they want whenever they want. Yeah. And we could put some ad or something beside it. I could promote my comedy show. I'm not building out down in that server space. I'm the bandwidth. Do you yeah. even understand? I would have to reinstall real player. Yeah, into real player. Whoa. Embedded and I'm in a codec. Yeah. So I right, fuck it then. I'll just build my own. And that's when I bought my URL and built my website. I, I built my out of, out of like a fuck you i'll do it yeah fuck you joe boo i do it myself <laughs> yeah and i put my prank calls on my own website just for birmingham people this is just for people yeah. in birmingham 
but they started downloading them and emailing them to other people and so that like in 0203 going viral meant you went viral over email yeah so you're on an email chain with hundreds of other people who've seen this prank call and all thought it was funny and also passed it it's that's like it, it is the form of TikTok clips now. It literally was that it was it was the genesis of retweets of TikTok clips of Instagram clips going viral. I couldn't buy server space fast enough. Really? My site kept crashing from out of towners coming to download my shit. So then I'm like, OK, well, then let's make a CD. Let's put that on the site to sell mail order. I'll do order for film. And I'm not making any money in radio at this point. Yeah. Still. We're like still first year. Buck Wild is paying me out of his pocket a piece of his quarterly bonus just because he appreciates me. This man's salt of the earth. I'll take a fucking bullet for that, man. Like, I'm making my little bullshit money on the road doing stand up, but I'm starting to understand this idea of the digital relationship yeah. with people. And so I took my pranks and I started condensing them. And this is to bring it back to how radio DJs really do help one another. I put like 20, 30 pranks on a CD. And I started mailing them to radio stations in markets where the comedy club did not book me. So smart. And I would tell that DJ, hey, man, just play my shit. All I ask is that you say my name. That's it. Say my website if you want. Say it or not. But please say my name when you play my shit. So the prank would blow up in that market. Free content for you. Free exposure for me. Let that marinate for three, four months. Then call that bitch ass comedy club back. Go, hey, you bitch. You didn't book me before. Yeah, but now. I'm on the radio. So I was asking for an MC slot. Now I want a feature. Damn. You and are- then I would get booked, and that helped me get booked. Then those DJs that work in Tupelo and El Paso yeah. and Colleen, eventually they work in Dallas. They work in Oklahoma they City. They bring you in. They, they remember you. They work in Houston. Yeah. They work in New Orleans. And they keep playing my shit in those markets too. So I was able to grow. To be, I grew with the DJ as their career grew, so that my free content with them. I just I didn't harness it right, man. I was ahead of. The what curve. are you talking about? Harness it right? I'm listening to everything I, you did, and I'm like, I just legitimately got so stoned at every radio station. It was like, I'll just be funny on the mic. Nah, I man. had this is what you're saying. The map that you let out in the process is so well executed. I just wish that I had done better with data collection. and then We I, all do. I put all my shit on YouTube, bro. In 2005, I had 150,000 YouTube followers. And then I got myself copyright striked because I just didn't, I just didn't value. Yeah. I didn't understand the value I, of the Listen, I did, I did a dumb thing like that. When Comedy Central put out my hour special, someone bootlegged it and put it on YouTube. And I remember the email where my agent was like, do we strike it down? And I was like, I, no, but... Yeah, we're going to get in trouble and I should have left it up because it would have gone other people would have saw it and instead no one saw it because Comedy Central you know Comedy yeah. Central played a special twice and now the algorithm's so tight and the, the copyright crawler is so tight online you can't get I that can't off I can't post my own shit yeah from my own special I've had I had Showtime strike down trailers that they gave me to post to post yeah email directly to me and yeah. then they're like no copyright infringement and you're like you gave me it i'm yeah. in, i'm in the clip and, and they're like no the yeah. person and oh a guy in our department is supposed to whitelist you and put you on the vip you can post our shit list and it's like it never man worked. i hope I, first off i appreciate you coming by and man, it's all good, and talking man. radio you're one of my favorite comedians and being able to hang you, with that and talk with you and i was excited when mcdaniel got hired by the dolphins I texted Roy, but I don't think Roy knew I knew McDaniel. So I was just like, hey, I'm on board with the Dolphins. And you wrote me back like, all right. <laughs> you wrote me back and thinking like, who gives a shit? And then now, and then I told you, I'm like, no, 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 I grew up with him. But you're a Dolphins fan. Yeah. And I know this is coming out in a couple weeks, but I am very nervous about Dolphins bills for the division this Sunday. Tua, Tua can pull it out of his ass. That I believe. Fingers crossed. Probably to it can pull that as ass. We need that home first rounder. Because what you don't want is to lose to Buffalo. And then have to go. And then have to go to fucking Buffalo. Or go to KC. Yeah. Or go somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you're one of my favorite comedians. I've always said I think you should have been the host for The Daily Show. Well, thank you, brother. Right after John. I'm just going to say that. Well, we'll I think see. you are. 
Who knows? By the time a, this airs, they probably still wouldn't have figured it out. Yeah, so you, your standups, <laughs> but your standups on a different level. I hope one day you become the mayor of Birmingham. You should be, with everything that's Oof. happened. Or maybe your son does. Maybe that's no, the. No, I want. I want him to stay in New York. <laughs> Keeping him in New York. Brand. I'll handle Birmingham. Boy. You go, let me go down and handle Birmingham. Yeah. It's like a snake. You got to put a glove on. You're like, now watch yeah. this. It'll bite you. You got to get you right in its face. what's weird about going back home now is that because I'm not there on a regular basis with radio and finger on the pulse of the community, I am kind of an outsider. So I do have to kind of make sure that I'm doing things in conjunction with locals that are really on the ground. Grinding. Well, now it's going to, so it doesn't seem like I'm coming in just, I know how to fix it. Cause I've been on cable. Well, watch it. <laughs> yeah. I got to I got to I got to host a correspondence dinner and they're like, well, that's not the energy we want. But if you go, I think you're, you're warming yourself up perfectly for a show in Birmingham. Cause now, now that you're a little displaced, you can come back and make the observations of this is what I've noticed. I didn't know my last stand up special will be shot in Birmingham. You're like your final one. Yeah. The last one. Because the first time I ever touched the stage was Birmingham. So I you like you wanted to, to to complete the cycle? It's a perfect bookend. Yeah. yeah. Well. That's not for at least another, I don't know, 10 years, five. Until they years. shut down stand-up and we have to go back to terrestrial you radio. No, bitch. These holograms coming. You have to fucking, <laughs> yeah, AI and holograms. You have to compete you were, with the ghost of Bernie Mac. And yeah, the you're like, bone. oh, I got bumped for prior <laughs> yeah. again. The prior, the yeah, prior the hologram. Prior AI. Yeah. Richard Jenny's bumping me again. <laughs> yeah. this, all these guys are coming back. Shit ain't, shit's funny now. It ain't gonna be funny. It's like Ghostbusters. The, you're like, sex robots start uh, becoming performance robots. Yeah. Who programmed the Patrice O'Neill into the sex <laughs> robot? <laughs> Just talking shit. Look at you, bitch, you robot bitch. Yeah, look at your tiny dick. And you go, I, just, I bought you because you were supposed to let me fuck you. <laughs> uh, Roy, you're the man, dude. Thanks so man, much for coming thank by. Thank you, man. Uh, website, go see him live. Roy Woods. Go watch his specials. Just go enjoy yeah, they're, Roy they're Wood. Free on, they're free on YouTube. Like, you don't even have to go through the Paramount Plus fuckery. They put them up? Finally. Did they really? Yeah, it took a whole pandemic. For the bit, finally, go watch Royce and go watch mine. I got a couple specials on Comedy I'm Central. Sure your shit's up. I gotta go look up Comedy Central YouTube. <laughs> yeah, they have a bunch of my shit. I didn't even know they were putting it out. Uh, you're the man, dude. Thanks yeah, so man. much. Thank you, and man. go Dolphins. Yes, go Do absolutely. Go Dolphins. Go Niners. Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs>